بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة When we look at the du'as of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam and the du'as of Rasulullah and the supplications that are in the Quran, we see that they teach us a few very important points. First of all, the du'as, they teach me how to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What should I ask for? In what language should I speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In what tone should I speak to Allah? If I want to know what is the best dua to ask for myself, the best dua is available in the Quran. These are the duas of the prophets. These are the supplications of the prophets of Allah. And Allah mentions what certain prophets used to say at certain moments. When you look at what the prophets say, they are the knowledgeable. They are complete. They know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore you see that their du'as, they make more sense. For example, the du'a, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. This is a du'a in the Qur'an. It's a very general statement, but it's very inclusive. When we do du'a, we say, Oh Allah, I want a car. Oh Allah, I want this job. I want this. I want that. We ask for specific things. But when we look at the du'as, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, O oh Allah, give me a good life, a hasana, in this life, wa fil akhirati hasana, and in the afterlife, let it be a good life, wa qina adhab nar and save us from the hellfire. We see that the du'as, they instruct us to pray for certain things. When we look at the du'as of the Ahlul Bayt, when we look at the du'as in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what we should pray for. And we should take Allah's advice when Allah tells us what we should pray for because this is what He would give and this is what He would answer. And this is the type of du'a that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would answer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, one of the du'as that we all should do is that we should pray for others. We should pray for people around us. We should pray for our community. We should pray for our society. This is one of the ways where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, the, the chances and the likelihood of your du'a being accepted for yourself will be much higher when you do du'a for others. This is one of the requirements for an accepted prayer, for an accepted dua. You pray for others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer you. Because scholars say one of the best type of akhlaq, the best type of morality that one could have is at-takhalluq bi akhlaq Allah, at-ta'abud bi akhlaq Allah, where you take the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you try to implement those qualities in your own life. What do I mean? When we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the most generous. Don't we say Allah is the most generous? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will see that if you are generous, He will be generous towards you. If I'm asking Allah, Oh Allah, give me this and give me that, but I'm stingy and I don't give to this person and that person, Allah is going to say, if this person doesn't give, why does he expect me to give him? If I say, oh Allah, forgive me for all of my sins, forgive me for this and that. But then when people 
ask me to forgive them, I refuse to forgive them, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive me. Whenever we should pray, we should also pray for others. Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, he narrates that I saw my mother Fatima in the middle of the night. She was standing and she was doing dua. She kept praying and praying all night. But I never heard her praying for us. I never heard her praying for herself. I heard her praying for the neighbors. I heard her praying for the people around us, for our community. So he says that after my mother finished her prayer, I asked her, Oh mother, I didn't see you pray for us. I saw that you prayed for the neighbors. She tells him, Ya bunay al-jar thumma dar Oh my dear son, we pray for the neighbors and then we pray for ourselves. We learn from this that this is the type of dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes to be asked. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see that you are merciful towards other people, that you are loving towards other people, that you are generous towards other people. Once He sees that from you, Allah will say, I am more generous than this person. Because Allah is more generous than all of us. Allah is more compassionate than us. Once He sees that we have those qualities, the chances of mercy will, <coughs> will be much more. Now when we speak about people around us, we also have to pray to the closest people to us, and then we go further from the circle. Allah says, Al-Aqrabun awla bil ma'roof. When you do dua, do dua for the closest people to you. Do dua for your family, do dua for your parents, do dua for your children. Al-Aqrabun awla bil ma'roof. You also do dua, they're around you, they're in your community, but they are also very close to you. Show love to them, show compassion to them. And this is why when we see in the Quran, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, numerous verses, numerous verses, Allah mentions the dua for the parents. And the dua of the parents. One of the most important conditions and requirements for your dua to be accepted is that you have to be in a good relationship with your parents. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs us to perform dua for our parents. In one verse, Allah says, رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيَّ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَوْمَ يَقُومُ الْحِسَابِ when you do dua, don't plan to go to paradise by, for, by yourself. When you go to paradise, try to take as many people with you. رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْ O Allah, forgive me and forgive my parents وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ and the believers and the mu'mineen and the mu'minat يَوْمَ يَقُومُ hisab. The hadith from Rasulullah, he says, that whenever you do dua, Allahumma ghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat. Oh Allah, forgive the believing men and believing women. Rasulullah says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will first of all forgive every single mu'min and mu'mina. Probably not all of their sins, but Allah will forgive them. And second, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the reward for praying for every single person. It's an easy statement. All you say, oh Allah, forgive all of the believers. Allah will give you the reward for the number of the believers. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another verse, Allah says, وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَقُلْ رَبِّ ارْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِي صَغِيرًا Allah says, lower yourself. وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلْ Lower yourself. Humble, humble yourself for your parents. Humble yourself. Bring yourself down. وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلْ The word dhul, it means humility. Humility, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want you to humiliate yourself in front of anyone. But when you humble yourself towards Allah, this is a sign of glory for you.
Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you do that towards your parents, this is a sign of honor and this is a sign of glory for you. وَاخْفَضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ Out of compassion, وَقُلْ رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا And say, Oh Allah, forgive them and have mercy on them the same way they had mercy on me when I was young. The same way they had sleepless nights for me when I was crying, when I was hungry, when I needed to be changed. It's difficult, especially for the mother. You see, some nights the mother does not sleep at all. If the child is sick, she becomes sick. If the child is crying, she cannot sleep. She cannot rest. She cannot do anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to appreciate every single person that has done anything good to us from society and our parents and also most importantly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why when we look at the du'as of the Ahlul Bayt, when we look at the du'as of Rasulullah, we see that in addition for asking for themselves, in addition for asking for paradise and asking for dunya and asking for akhirah, we see that the du'as, they pray for others and most importantly, they pray for the parents and the family. In du'a Abu Hamza, the Imam says, Allahumma ghfir li wa li walidayya warhamhuma kama rabbayani saghira. Wajzihima bil ihsani ihsanan wa bis ayyaati ghufrana. A beautiful du'a, praying for your family. This is one of the conditions for a prayer <coughs> to be accepted. If you want your prayer to be accepted, we do du'a for others. We pray for others. We care for others. It is narrated, and caring for others, we should not discriminate who we should care for. We should not be prejudiced who we care for. We should not be prejudiced and discriminate who we show love and compassion to. Today, we need to show the world the essence of Islam. We need to show the world the akhlaq of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. Did the Ahlul Bayt discriminate when it came to giving to others? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one verse, Surah Al-Insan, He says, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا The Ahlul Bayt, they were fasting for three days and every day at the time of breaking the fast, the first day a poor person, the second day an orphan, the third day a non-Muslim Asir war prisoner came and knocked the door. Each one of those days they gave, they didn't discriminate, this is a Muslim, this is a non-Muslim. Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, it is narrated that Prophet Ibrahim every day when it's time to eat, he used to go and stand in front of his home and he used to wait for someone who was passing by. He would bring them and he would eat with them. This is the akhlaq of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the hadith says that this was one of the reasons how he became Khalilullah, the friend of Allah, because of that quality, because of that act. A very social act, an act that is caring for other people. So the hadith says that one day he brought someone, he came, he sat with that person. Ibrahim said, Bismillah, in the name of Allah. That person didn't say anything. Prophet Ibrahim told him, aren't you going to say Bismillah? Say the name of Allah before you eat. That person said, I don't believe in Allah. I don't believe in God. He told him everything that you have, your life, your death, your food, your sustenance, everything is from Allah. Say the name of Allah. That man refused. He said, I don't want to say the name of Allah. So Ibrahim, he told him, then you're not eating with me. Since you're not mentioning the name of God who gave you everything, you're not going to eat with me. The man said, okay, you invited me to eat and now you're telling me to leave, I'll leave. He left. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to Ibrahim. Allah tells him, oh Ibrahim, this man, I've been feeding him and providing for him his whole life. 
Not one day did I expect him to come and thank me. Did I come and ask him to thank me, condition on me giving him and providing for him. Now one time you want to feed this person one meal and you ended up kicking him out? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Ibrahim through the story that show mercy to people around you. Show mercy to everyone around you. So Ibrahim, he goes and he brings that man and he feeds him. And then he tells him that this is what my Lord told me. The man, he begins to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the moral is that we should care about people around us. And most importantly, we should care for the members of our society, for our family. And this is why when we look at the du'as of the Ahlul Bayt, when we look at the verses in the Qur'an, we see that the people that we are most indebted to, they are our parents, they are our family. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, in one verse, وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا Allah says, we have asked a wasiyah, a will, ordered the man to show ihsan towards his parents. To show ihsan. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says ihsan. It means that you don't let them ask you for something. You go and you do it for them. You, you see what they need before they ask you. This is ihsan. When it comes to everyone, all members of society, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, treat them with equality. You have to treat with every, everyone with equality. That means if someone did something wrong to me, I have the right to go and do something wrong to that person. But when, I, when it comes to my parents, do I have the right to go and answer back or do something wrong if they did that wrong thing to me? No. Because we are ordered to treat them with ihsan. وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ كُرْهًا وَوَضَعَتْهُ كُرْهًا وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ وَبَلَغَ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةً قَالَ رَبِّ أَوْزِعْنِي أَنْ أَشْكُرَ نِعْمَتَ أَشْكُرَ نِعْمَتَكَ الَّتِي أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيَّ وَعَلَى وَالِدَيِّ وَأَنْ أَعْمَلَ صَالِحًا تَرْضَاهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that once a person matures, that is when they begin to understand. You see many people, they've matured, but they still don't show respect towards their parents. They still don't show respect towards their family. And you know when is the time that your family is in need of you the most? Not when they're young, not when they could walk, not when they could go and get their own cup of water. That time they're very independent. They're not going to need you at that time. The time that they're going to need you is once they get older. This is why Allah also instructs for that time. Allah says in the Quran, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَن لَا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Allah has decreed that you do not worship anyone other than Him. And then the second order, immediately after Tawheed, after believing in Allah, and not associating a partner with Allah, the second order, Allah doesn't say and that you pray, that you go to Hajj, that you fast. Allah says, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Second, immediately after Tawheed, is the akhlaq towards the family. And then Allah says, إِمَّا يَبْلُغْنَ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرِ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا Once they're older, once they're at an old age, once they're fragile, إِمَّا يَبْلُغْنَ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرِ فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍ Do not even say uff. You know sometimes when someone asks you to do something, that just that sound that we make, uff. Why do I have to do that? Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam, he says, if there was something that was less than that, Allah would have mentioned it in the Qur'an. Allah does not say, and don't curse at them, don't talk back at them. It's just that sound that you make, that uff that one says, 
That's the least thing that anyone could do. Allah orders in the Quran, in a book that came 1400 years ago, this is the book of akhlaq. This is the book of civilization. This is the book that teaches you how to live your day-to-day -day lives. This is the religion of Islam. For some people, religion for them, it's just, I pray to God and I ask for, I ask for heaven. I ask for the afterlife. That's one, that's one factor of religion. Another factor is the socialization. Islam, religion, it teaches me how to care for people around me, how to care for my family, how to care for my society. How to show love and akhlaq towards everyone around us. And this is the most time that we need to implement the teachings of Islam, especially during these days where every day you hear someone committed a crime in the name of the religion of Islam. And today we all woke up to hear that over 50 people were killed by someone who's claiming to be a Muslim. The religion of Islam does not con condone this act of terror, this act of murder. If you have enemies, if you have people that you disagree with, that's not the way that you go and you deal with it. If that was the way, we would have seen that the life of Rasulullah, the lives of the Ahl al-Bayt, they would have been completely different. The religion of Islam, it does not condone and it condemns this act of terror that we see going on today. Just yesterday, just one day out of the year, we finally hear the name of Islam being mentioned in a good way because of Marhum Muhammad Ali. The next day, someone had to go and bring, back, bring down the name of Islam once again. This is why it is our duty to show the akhlaq of the religion of Islam to everyone around us, to the non-Muslims, to the Christians, to the Jews, to people of other religions. And through the ihsan, through the social, social rules of the religion of Islam, you will be able to invite others. Allah doesn't necessarily ask you to go and speak and give a speech and convince people to join the religion of Islam. No. Allah just wants you to be a good Muslim. If you do that, people will see the akhlaq of a true Muslim. It is narrated that one of the companions of Imam Sadiq by the name of Zakaria ibn Adam, this man was a Christian. He saw the Imam in Medina and he converted to the religion of Islam and he followed the path of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. So this man, Zakaria, he tells the Imam, I'm going back to Kufa. I'm going back to my city. And my mother is a Christian. My mother is not a Muslim. Now that I've joined the religion of Islam, how should I treat my mother? How should I treat my family? The Imam asked him, does she eat pork? He said, no, she does not eat pork. Then the Imam told him, then you could eat from the food that she provides for you. And you could eat from the food because she's buying it from a Muslim market at that time, Al the city of Kufa. She's buying it from a Muslim market. If she's cooking food, eat from the food. And then the Imam instructed him. He tells him, you have to show the best akhlaq towards your mother. You have to take care of your mother. Show love and respect towards your mother. So this man, he goes back to his mother and he begins to take care of his mother. His mother was old. He would go and he would feed her. He would go and he would wash her feet. He would make sure that she is clean. He would make sure that she does not need anything. So she tells him, oh my dear son, I saw that you have changed. You were not like this with me before. I saw that you've become different. He tells her, yes, this is because I saw a man who taught me and he told me that this is how I should be with my mother. I've joined the religion of Islam and I saw Ja'far ibn, Mu ja ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq. He tells me, ja I saw Ja'far al-Sadiq. He tells me that this is how I should treat my mother. She tells him, is he a prophet, this man? He tells her, no, he's not a prophet, but he's a son of a prophet. He's from the descendants of a prophet. And he teaches her about the religion of Islam. 
she accepts the religion of Islam and she passes away a few days later. This man, he goes and he tells Imam Sadiq the story and Imam Sadiq becomes very happy with what this man has done. And the Imam tells him that your du'as for yourself will be accepted once you begin to show good akhlaq towards the people around you, specifically your family, specifically your mother and your father. One day a man, he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, what are my obligations towards my parents? Rasulullah replied, la tamshi amamah. When you walk, you show respect to your father. You show respect to your father, do not walk in front of your father. لا تمشي أمامه ولا تستسب له Do not be a reason where people will curse your father. You know in some cultures you see that when people they want to curse at someone, they're not going to curse that person. They curse their mother and their father. So Rasulullah says, don't do anything where people are going to curse your father because of your actions. Your father didn't do anything. Your mother didn't do anything. But because of your actions, people are going to curse and talk bad about your parents. وَلَا تَجْلَسْ قَبْلَهِ Do not sit before your father. Do not sit before your mother. Give them the best seat. Give them the best place to sit. وَلَا تَدَعْهُ بِاسْمِهِ And do not call your father, your mother by their name. Every father, every mother, they, they like to be called Baba, Mama, Dad, Mom. This is what they like to be asked. This is what they like to be called. Calling them by their name, it's a sign of disrespect. So, this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi teaches. This is what Rasulullah teaches us and this is the akhlaq of the religion of Islam. One day a man, he committed a crime. He committed a sin. And he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He tells Rasulullah, Oh Rasulullah, I have committed a terrible sin. I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me. I want Allah to forgive me for my sins. What should I do? Teach me something. Yesterday we mentioned how one of the ways for Allah to forgive you is to go next to Rasulullah. You ask Rasulullah to forgive, you ask, uh, Rasulullah asks Allah to forgive you and you do istighfar. Next to Rasulullah, Allah will forgive you. This man, Rasulullah, he taught him another way. He taught him a second way for his sins to be forgiven. Rasulullah asked him, are your parents alive? The man, he said, my mother has passed away, but my father is alive. So Rasulullah tells him, if you want Allah to forgive you, then go and serve your father for the rest of your life and for the rest of his life. Serve your father. Rasulullah does not tell him you have to go and pray, you have to go and do so many other things. He leaves everything. He tells him, go and serve your father and Allah will forgive your sins. The man, he heard from Rasulullah the order and he turned around and he left. Rasulullah, there were Muslims sitting around him. He tells the Muslims, he tells his companions, he tells them, if his mother was alive, Allah would have forgiven him much quicker. Meaning that serving your mother, it's a sign that will, Allah will forgive you much quicker. But since, your mother, since the mother has passed away, go and serve your father. This is the akhlaq of the religion of Islam. In another story, a man, he came to Rasulullah after Hajjat al wada Rasulullah, he performed the Hajj with all of the Muslims, over a hundred thousand Muslims. After the end of the Hajj, after everyone wants to leave, go back to their homes, a man, he came carrying his mother on his shoulders, carrying his mother on his back. At that time, they didn't have wheelchairs. They didn't have any of these, you know, the tools that we have today. He came carrying his mother on his back. He tells Rasulullah, Oh Rasulullah, I performed the Hajj. I did the Umrah. I stood in Arafat. I went to Mina. I did the Rami. I did all of the acts of Hajj with my mother on my back. 
I carried her. I walked all the way with my mother on my back. Have I fulfilled my duties and my responsibilities towards my mother? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi replied that you did not do what the, you did not go through the pain of one contraction that your mother went through. One contraction, one hour, one minute in the labor that you will not be able to pay back your mother for one contraction that she went through. For one pain, one moment of pain that she went through. Rasulullah tells him, continue to serve your mother until she passes away. The problem the difference is there are some people that serve their parents once their parents are older. There are people that take care of their family once their family is older. But there's a very big difference between the mother, the father when they take care of a child and a son or daughter that take care of their elderly parents. What's the difference? The difference is that when your mother, when your father take care of you, when they have sleepless nights because of you, they have hope to see you get older. They hope that you're going to get older. And they have hope that you're going to have a very successful future. But when the, when the son or daughter is taking care of their parents, when they're taking care of their grandparents, when they're taking care of the adults, what do they say? They say, I'll take care of them. But sooner or later, this is going to stop. They're going to pass away, they're going to die, and I'm not going to have to deal with this anymore. Even the one that shows the most love towards their family, eventually this is the sunnah of hayat. You believe that the adults, the older ones, they're going to die out first. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you will never be able to repay your parents. And this is why Allah instructs the Muslims the believers to show ihsan and show respect towards the parents. Not only because it's a social thing, it's a good thing to do, but because it will improve your life. A few nights ago when we were speaking about the qadr, when we were speaking about the destiny, we spoke that there are certain things that change someone's destiny. One of them is kindness and ihsan towards the family. In a hadith from Rasulullah, he says, Man sarrahu. He who wishes to have a long life. Man sarrahu an yumad fi umrih wa yazdadu fi rizqih. He who wishes or she who wishes that their lives will be longer and his sustenance, her sustenance will increase. Fal yamsi barran bi walidayh wa soolan li rahimih. Let this person be bar al walidayn. Meaning that you're always, your parents are always satisfied with you. And this is something that will bring good luck in this life. It will bring barakah towards this life and towards the afterlife. We have a chapter in the Quran by the name of Surah Al-Baqarah, the chapter of the cow. Do you guys know why it is called the chapter of the cow? There's a story behind this. The story is that there was a man from Bani Israel, a young man who was a businessman. He had a business of buying and selling. One day, a group of people, they came and they wanted to buy something from him. He wants to go to open the container, to open the storage, to take out that thing that they're buying. He sees that the key is not with him. The key is with his father. He goes to take the key from his father. He sees that his father is sleeping. The father is sleeping. And the key is with the father. He decides, should I wake up my father and ruin his sleep? And I will be able to make money? Or should I let these people go and the rizq, the sustenance will come later? He decides that he's not going to wake his father up. He said, who cares? It's not a big deal. This is one transaction. Later on, someone else will come and buy from me. Even though it was a big transaction. His father wakes up and he realizes that this young man, his son, he missed out on a transaction because he did not want to ruin his father's sleep. 
His father was sleeping. He wanted to keep his father comfortable. He wanted to keep his father sleeping. So his father becomes happy and he has mercy towards his son. He goes and he gives them a cow that they had. They had probably a cow, one or two. He gives them that cow that they had. Meanwhile, in Bani Israel, in that community, there was a murder that took place. This is a story in the Quran. There was a murder that took place. The people, they wanted to find out what's their, they, they wanted to find out who was, the, who was the perpetrator, who was the murderer. They didn't know. There were no signs. So they come to Prophet Musa alayhi salam and they tell him, <coughs> Oh Musa, you speak to Allah. You talk to your Lord, ask Allah to tell us who the murderer is. So Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he speaks to Allah, and then Musa replies, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَىٰ لِقَوْمِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَن تَذْبَحُوا بَقَرَةً Musa replies, he tells them, Allah orders you to slaughter a cow. Slaughter a cow, and then you will find out who was the murderer. Now here, Bani Israel, they kept asking Prophet Musa, what kind of a cow? Ask your Lord, what kind of a cow? There are millions of cows. So Allah keeps replying and making it narrower and narrower. First, he said, for example, it's any cow that walks on the earth, any cow. And then it became more specific. It had to be a yellow cow. It had to be this type of cow. It had to have specific signs. They went and they looked around. It turned out to be that cow, the cow that the father had given the son. They came and they tell him, we want to buy this cow from you. He tells them, why do you need this specific cow? You could buy any other cow. They, they tell him that we have this case of murder and this is what Allah has ordered. Allah ordered us for this specific cow. So he goes to his mother. His mother tells him, jack up the price. Don't sell it cheap. They need this specific cow, don't sell it cheap. He kept raising the price and raising the price until his mother told him, let them fill that cow with gold and jewelry and silver and then they could have it. This man, he became rich because they needed to buy the cow and they gave him all of the money that they could so that they could take the cow. Because of what? Because of one ihsan. A whole chapter in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, by, by the name of the cow. Of course, this is just a portion of the whole, the whole chapter. It's, it's mentioned, the story, it has to do with someone who was kind with his, with his parents. Then they go and they kill the cow, and then they take a piece of flesh, and they put it on the, on the deceased person. The person, he wakes up from the dead, from his death, and he points to his cousin. He says, this person killed me. Then they find out the murder was solved. The crime was solved because of that story. And this is a story that's mentioned in the Quran. So we see that if you are good with your parents, if you have good akhlaq towards your family, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you. And on the other hand, if someone is not good with their parents, aquq al-walidayn, this is something that will bring the punishment in this life and in the afterlife. Allah says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ يَنْقُضُونَ عَهْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مِيثَاقِهِ There's a covenant with Allah. Allah says, respect me, show respect to Allah, thank Allah, and thank your parents. The ones who break that mithaq, that covenant, وَيَقْطَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُوصَلْ and they cut off the relationship that Allah has ordered for you to build that relationship, for you to keep that relationship. Allah says, Those people are the cursed ones. In a hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, Man nadara ila abawayh, nadara maqitin. He who frowns. He who looks at his parents with a very bad look. Nadara maqit, an angry look. Man nadara ila abawayh, nadara maqitin, wa huma zaliman lah, 
لم يقبل الله منه صلاة. Imam Sadiq says he who looks at his parents in a frowning way, in a very upsetting way, and they have oppressed him, they have done something wrong to him, Allah will not accept his prayers. Because Allah says even if they are mushrik, even if they are non-Muslims in the Quran, He says you still have to respect them. Don't obey them if they're telling you to, do, to obey them in the haram, to do something wrong, but you still have to show the best signs of respect. Now, one fiqh question, a question of jurisprudence. Is it wajib for me? Is it obligatory upon me to obey my parents? The answer is no, not necessarily. I have to make sure that my parents are not upset with me, but I'm not required to obey every single thing that they tell me. Unless if I disobey them in that specific thing, then and they become angry with me, then it will become haram. But for example, your father tells you, you could go to this school or you could go to that school. But he says, I recommend you go to this school. The father is not going to get mad if you decide to do something else. Or sometimes the parents, they recommend for their children to, for example, do something. You know, this person, he came and he proposed, marry this person, accept to marry this person. Do you have to listen to that order? No. Because this is something that has to do with yourself. And we see that sometimes the parents, they have expectations that are unrealistic, that are very far, and it's very difficult to follow that expectation and follow that order. It's not haram. It's not haram. What is haram according to the hadith and according to the jurisprudence is to upset your parents. However, you have to always try, struggle to keep your parents happy. Sometimes, for example, you tell your parents, I want to come to the masjid, I want to pray. But then you also have an option to stay at home and take care of your sick mother, to take care of your sick father, to take care of your family. Maybe your mother is not going to ask you to stay. But if you stay, this is something that will make her happier. That is more recommended than going in the masjid and praying with everyone. Staying home and taking care of the family is more recommended. Even when it comes to sometimes a wajib act. One day, the Muslims, they were, go out, they were going out during the time of the Prophet for jihad. To defend the Muslims. The Muslims were being attacked. Rasulullah, he ordered that the Muslims go out. There was a man... He came and he told Rasulullah, I want to come and join you. But there is one problem. The problem is that I have old parents. My father and my mother, they're old. And I'm the only one. I'm the only one that could take care of them. I'm the only one that could provide for them. Rasulullah, he tells, he tells him, leave the jihad. Stay at home and take care of your parents. Take care of your family. This is what Allah expects from you. And then Rasulullah, he says a very beautiful statement. He says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ I swear by Allah. وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَأُنْسُهُمَا بِكَ يَوْمًا وَلَيْلَةً خَيْرٌ مِنْ جِهَادِ سَنَةً For your parents to be happy with you for one hour, one day, one night, this is better than jihad for one full year. One full year of fighting in the way of Allah. Making your parents happy. Sometimes the parents, they don't expect much from you. They just want you to be around. They want you to be with them, sitting with them, talking with them, drinking tea with them. This is what they enjoy. Rasulullah says that, that that act, that is better than a jihad of one year. I will conclude with this story. One day during the life of the Prophet, there was a man who was dying, a young man who was dying. So Rasulullah heard that this man was going through, he was dying, he was suffering. So Rasulullah said, let's go and visit him. Let's go and see how he is. It's mustahab to go and visit someone when they're sick, when they're dying, being there for them. So Rasulullah, he goes, he sees that this man, he cannot speak. He's dying. So Rasulullah, he asked, around. He sees that this person, even Rasulullah is around him, this person can't speak. Rasulullah asked, where is his father? Where is his mother? 
Who out of his parents is alive? They tell him the father has passed away, but the mother is around. He said, call the mother. The mother, she comes. He tells her, <coughs> are you satisfied with him? She tells him, to be honest, no, I'm not happy with him. He tells, Rasulullah tells her, this is the reason that he cannot say his shahada. This is the reason that he cannot speak at the hour of death. There are certain people, this is why we always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our dua, Oh Allah, allow me to be able to say the shahada. Allow me to be able to speak in the moments of death. There are certain people, they go quiet. Of course, there are many reasons for that. One of the reasons from this story is that this person, his mother was not happy with him. So Rasulullah, he tells her, the only way for this person, to, to, his soul to be relieved is for you to be satisfied with him. She tells him, oh Rasulullah, I can't. I can't. He hurt me too much. I took care of him. I fed him. I changed him. I saw him grow. Then once he grew up, he began to hit me. He began to talk back. He began to abuse me. He got married. He started treating his wife better than he treats me. I can't. It's been seven years. I've been suffering because of what he's been doing. So Rasulullah, he saw that there was no way. He tells his companions, bring some wood. Gather some wood. They go and they gather wood. Then Rasulullah tells them, light the wood on fire. They go and they light the wood on fire. Then Rasulullah, he tells them, carry him and throw him in the fire. The mother at that moment, she says, Ya Rasulullah, what are you doing? You want to burn my son? He tells her, you are burning him because you're not happy with him. You're not satisfied with him. The only way, the only passport that will allow him to go through is if you are satisfied with him. She begins to cry and she says, I'm happy with him. I'm satisfied with him. This is the heart of the mother. Then the man, he was able to speak. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he teaches him a dua. He tells him, repeat after me. He tells him, say, Ya man yaqbalu al-yaseer. Rasulullah first asked him, asks him, what do you see? He says, I see something very ugly. It's choking me. It's on my chest. I cannot, I can't see. I can't say anything. So Rasulullah tells him, recite this dua. Ya man yaqbalu al-yaseer. Wa ya'fu anil kathir. Iqbal minni al-yaseer. Wa'fu anil kathir. Oh he, Ya man yaqbalu al-yaseer. Allah, he accepts very little from us. Allah does not expect very much from us. Ya man yaqbalu al-yaseer. Our worship is very little compared to what Allah has done for us. Ya man yaqbalu al-yaseer. Wa ya'fu anil kathir. But he forgives the many wrongs that we, that we have done. Iqbal minni al-yaseer. Accept the little that I have done and forgive the many bad deeds that I have done. This young man, he kept reciting this until Rasulullah asked him, what do you see now? He says, now I see a beautiful image coming to me. And that ugly image, it's gone. I see a beautiful image <coughs> coming to me. The man was able to say the shahada and he passed away at that moment. One of the consequences of dua not being accepted, not only dua not being accepted, one of the consequences of not being able to say the shahada is angering the parents. This is why we are speaking about a series of dua, the conditions of dua. This is also one of the conditions of dua. There are many social issues that control, the, that have the keys to our dua, that have the keys to our prayers. It's, your prayers are not just you asking Allah and you go and you oppress and you talk back to this person and that person. If you want your prayers to be accepted, you have to set your issues straight with everyone around you and most importantly, your family and your parents. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep our parents satisfied with us, our family satisfied with us, and even after their death, sometimes after the, after the parents' death, there's a hadith that says that a group of people, their parents died 
They were Barr al walidain then they become, became Aq al walidain They had, after their parents' death, their relationship suffered. And there's another group of people, they had a bad relationship during their parents' life. After their parents' death, their relationship became better. How? By giving charity on their behalf, by feeding people on their behalf, by reciting Qur'an for your parents, by visiting their graves. These are all things that can rebuild your relationship with your parents. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to improve our relationship with our parents and as a result of that, accept our du'as and our prayers. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala ahli baytih al-tayyibin al-tahirin.